Welcome to the OI Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Townsend, and we are here with Theo van den Hout discussing an ancient Hittite plague that the Hittites believed started in Egypt. Welcome, Theo. Thank you, Steve, for having me. Theo, let's start out with a basic question. Who were the Hittites? Yeah, their period of uh, political flowering was between 1650 and 1200 BC. Uh, Their kingdom, empire, sometimes people say, was located in what we nowadays call the modern Republic of Turkey. Right here, you see the Middle East, uh, the modern Middle East as we know it, and you see right in the center Anatolia, which is the classical name for modern-day Turkey. And you see it surrounded by countries like Greece, Russia. Iraq is not mentioned there, but of course, everybody knows nowadays where Iraq is. Iran, Syria, and Egypt. And those were the main players in that period between, let's say, the second half of the second millennium BC, or what we also know as the Late Bronze Age. What would plague have been like to people in the ancient world, or is there a comparison that we can draw to what we're all going through today? Oh, yeah, I think not that much has changed in the sense that it must have been scary for people, because plague or epidemics, pandemics, as we now like to say, uh, are such an invisible enemy, as it's often said. You don't, you don't see anything there is, so you don't know what you can do against it. Um, you can get it through or from everybody. Uh, so it makes it uh, a scary thing. And I don't think that has changed in, in any way. Do we have any documentation of such events in in your studies? Oh, yeah. There are two main sources. We have a number of, let's say, more general sources. We have rituals that the Hittites performed whenever they felt there was an epidemic or a pandemic going on. These are texts that describe the ritual prescribe, if you will, that they could sort of pull off the shelf, the clay tablet with the prescription, and then they could carry out the ritual and they would probably hope that it did its work. So that's more general. And we have quite a few of them. And the fact that we have quite a number of them already tells us that the the Hittites and I guess ancient peoples in general were quite familiar with the phenomenon of an epidemic, of of a plague going around. And the other thing, the other set of evidence, so to speak, is very detailed in the sense that it, uh, we have information on a very particular instance of, a, of an ep- epidemic that must have engulfed, you could say, the ancient Middle East, not just the Hittite kingdom, around, or let's say, in at, towards the end of the 14th century BC. It probably started around 13, let's say, 1320. And according to the main source, it lasted about 20 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. 20 years. Mm-hmm. We hope that won't happen to us. Yes. <laughs> In the Hittite point of view, whenever something happened in daily life that was out of the ordinary, let's say something very serious like an earthquake, or but also an illness of a family member, and kind of everything in between, floods, etc., etc., in the Hittite view, that immediately meant, oh, the gods are punishing us for something. But the gods don't tell you uh, why. <laughs> what it was that you did in the past that makes them now punish you through a plague uh, or through this earthquake or the flood or, or, the, or the illness. Um, no, it's up to you, the individual Hittite, to find out uh, what it was and which god is angry. Because as you may know, the Hittites had the proverbial thousand gods, which is quite true. If, if we count about all the names of Hittite gods listed in the Hittite texts, you come very close to a thousand. Uh, the Hittites liked to add foreign gods to their pantheon, which is why they ended up with mm-hmm. a thousand gods. So it was up to the humans, to the Hittites, to find out which god was angry, why he or she was angry, and what they could do again to 
appease to God, to soothe his or her anger and to restore the, the, the balance in life again, to return to the normal situation where you don't have to be afraid of anything. That must have been tough to say, who is it that I offended? Who, which of these thousand gods? Presumably you had maybe nature gods or were gods that you could maybe eliminate, you know, 500 or eliminate 250 gods and concentrate on the other 750. But I don't think it is so much the, for them figuring out which group of gods or to eliminate groups of gods. It, I think it prompted them mostly to first search in their conscience. What did I do wrong? But it, one more thing that made it difficult is that it doesn't have to be you. It can also have been your family, your predecessors, your father, for example, as we will see today later on. It could be basically anything, but you would have to search your conscience. And then probably the God would follow from that. For example, in the, the big plague that we have a lot of information on with the Hittites, so Morshili first had to go back to his conscience and dig in, the, in his past to see what it was that might have set up the gods' anger. One of the things, for example, was a, one of the storm gods, as the Hittites called them. The Hittites had violated a treaty uh, with the Egyptians. The treaty was as they saw it, imposed on them by the storm god. So if they violated the treaty, then it was most likely the storm god uh, who was angry. And now they had a number of storm gods, but this was the highest storm god, the storm god of the the Hittite lands, the land of Hatti. Um, So I think once they had found for themselves something that, ooh, yeah, this I have done wrong, then I think the god might follow quickly. I see. Most of the information on this comes from what we call a series of plague prayers that Morshili, the Hittite king who reigned during this plague, had spoken or, or, or spoke to the gods or had spoken through other people, through his priests, for example. In those prayers, he, he is kind of desperate. So this is the introduction to what we call the second plague prayer. And Morshili is very emotional. He comes right in because the gods know what he's talking about. Morshili knows what he's talking about. He is at the end of his tether. He doesn't know what to do anymore. So he says, storm god of Hati, my lord, and gods of Hati, my lords, what have you done? You have allowed a plague into Hatti land, and Hatti land has been very heavily oppressed by this plague. In the time of my father, Shupiluliuma, and my brother, people have started to die. And even now that I, Morshili, have become a priest to the gods, that is, I became a king, people continue to die into my days. And this is now the 20th year that dying continues in Hatiland. And still, the plague has not lifted from Hatiland. I cannot overcome the agony in my heart, nor can I overcome any longer the anguish in my body. Mm. And he then tells the gods how he tried everything. He went to every conceivable deity, every conceivable temple. He prayed, he probably gave offerings and gifts, conducted oracle investigations to find out what it was that the gods expected him to do to end the plague. And yet, still, it's now been 20 years and nothing has happened. So he's really quite desperate. And he's thinking, it's got to be this treaty breaking. Right, as one of the reasons, because in the end, he comes up uh, with three main reasons that he sees, that he identifies. And it's also very interesting how he says that he sent his people, his scribes, into the royal tablet collection, and he told them, search for possible reasons, give me anything that I can work with. And so the first uh, thing that he identifies as a possible cause is offerings to the river, to the god of the river Euphrates, which is on the eastern border of the Hittite kingdom. So, uh, and he tells that 
apparently uh, former kings used to annually bring offerings to the river Euphrates, the river Mala, as he calls it. Uh, but then he apparently realizes that since the beginning of his father's reign, this famous king, Shupiluliuma, um, it has not happened. Kings has, have discontinued that offering. So that's number one. So the deity of the river Mala, the river Euphrates, may be angry. The second reason is what you just referred to, this border dispute with Egypt. Now, the border with Egypt was not in Egypt as we might imagine it. No, it, there was a Egypt controlled a lot of the Levantine area. So that's nowadays Israel, uh, Lebanon and Syria. And sort of in Syria, there was a border between Egyptian controlled territory and Hittite controlled territory. And at one point... Uh, the Hittites had made incursions into the Egyptian-controlled territory of Syria. And by doing so, they violated an earlier treaty between the Hittites and the Egyptians. And that, according to Morshley, could have been the second reason for the god's mm -hmm. anger. Because uh, at the end of a treaty, the, uh, the Hittites always list a whole host of gods um, by whom they swear or to whom they swear that they will abide by the stipulations of the treaty. And usually also there is a blessing formula and a curse formula, a blessing formula saying that if both parties to the treaty stick to the stipulations of the treaty, oh, they will be happy forever. But if they don't, and this is the curse formula, then may the gods destroy them. And so this is what Morshili now thinks. He says, oh, wait a minute. We, or actually my father, invaded the Egyptian-controlled territory in Syria. By doing so, he violated the treaty. And now the gods, and especially the storm god, uh, who imposed the treaty on them, is coming back at us. And note that uh, the, the, the gods, uh, well, they may have started the plague right towards the end of Shupiluluma's reign, but the brunt of the plague falls on Morshli, the son, who, he doesn't uh, stop saying, uh, had noth nothing to do with the whole thing. It was all his father, but okay. Um, so that's uh, the second reason that Morshli identifies. And then the third reason is... Shupiluliuma, his father, came to the throne very likely in a not very regular way. It is very likely that there was a young king preceding him who hardly figures in our texts, to whom people had sworn their loyalty, and yet he was murdered. And that is how Shupiluliuma came to the throne. And although Morsley doesn't say it explicitly. He clearly suggests that his father was very much implicated in the murder of his predecessor. And uh, so that's the third reason, the murder of this young predecessor uh, and how Shubhuluma, his father, came to the throne. So, and note how all three reasons are attributed to his father. It was these offerings to the river Mala, the river Euphrates, that his father discontinued. There is this treaty which his father violated, and there is this murder in which his father, again, was implicated. So Morshley says, explicitly also says, I had nothing to do with this. It was all my father. And of course, the gods instantly then stopped the plague and said, we understand. <laughs> yeah, you wish. Uh, or more. <laughs> uh, no, uh, no, not at all. Because as, as uh, we talked about, uh, this lasted for 20 years, well into or almost covering most of uh, Morshili's own reign. Well, well, do we have any idea of what the numbers were? I mean, it's 20 years, so I imagine it's 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 huge. Like the numbers that the plague affected or the deaths, do we have any uh, archeological or historical record of 
how many people it affected or what the scale of this was in spite of its length? Mm, no, not really. I think archaeological, I can't think of anything. Yeah. Uh, as far as the texts are concerned, um, Mursley just says that a lot of people were dying and kept dying. Uh, but he doesn't give any numbers. Uh, but even after 20 years, people still keep on dying. And maybe you can, you can read something out of the, uh, his repeated urging to the gods not to let also the people die who in the gods' temples take care of the daily offerings of bread and wine. So Morsley is almost you could say psychologically blackmailing the gods a little bit when he keeps saying, don't let the people who bring the daily bread offerings and libations to you in your temples, don't let them die too. So it, it seems as, it, as if it is really affecting everybody in society. At least that's kind of the feeling that it, that it gives me. And uh, so basically what Morsley is saying here, gods, if you don't watch out, there will be nobody left to bring to you your offerings by which you live. So you better be wise and stop this plague or you might die as well. I don't know. It sounds like there's a lot of blame throwing. It sounds like that's what his, his, his tactics are, are, you know, blame throwing and, uh, and, and threatening. Does he ever take any kind of accountability or, or be humble in the presence of the gods? The only thing he can bring himself to say is that, okay, you are right, O oh gods, it's true, we did it. Let me read you two or three short quotes. Morsley says here, I made an oracle inquiry concerning the plague about the offering to the river Mala. And in that case too, it was determined for me, Morsley, to present myself to the storm god of Hati, my lord. So, okay, here it is. I confessed my sin to the storm god. It is true. We have done it. He, he, he speaks of we. That's the best he can do at this moment. He just refuses to take final responsibility. But he, so he says, it is true, we have done it, that it didn't happen in my days, that it happened in my father's days, I know all too well. And then in a second part, um, he again, he says, storm god of Hati, my lords, and all the gods, my lords, as it happens, people sin. My father too sinned. He broke his word to the storm god of Hati. That was this treaty business. I, on the other hand, I didn't sin at all. But as it happens, a father's sin passes down to his son. And to me too, my father's sin passed down. So now, before the storm god of Hati, my lord, and before the gods, my lords, I have confessed it. It is true, we have done it. Again, he says only we. He still cannot bring himself to say I. And he continues, since I have confessed my father's sin, let the storm god, my lords, and the gods, my lords, their mind be satisfied again. Have mercy on me again and ban the plague from Hati land. Do not let those few remaining who take care of the bread offerings and libations die on me. So still, only we. But, and it's only at the very end of the prayer that he finally forces himself to take full personal responsibility. To the storm god, my lord, I make a plea. Because of the plague. Oh, listen to me, O oh, storm god of Hati, my lord, and save me. I give you the following to consider. A bird seeks refuge in its cage, and the cage saves it. Or, let's say something weighs heavily on a servant. He will make a plea to his lord, and his lord will then listen to him, and will have mercy on him. And whatever weighed on him, the master will set it right for him. And if some servant has sinned, but confesses it as a sin to his Lord, 
Okay, then his Lord will have his way with him as he wishes. But since the servant confesses to his Lord, the Lord's mind will be satisfied. And his Lord will not punish that servant. Morshli is here going back to the idea that the Hittite king was a servant to the gods. The gods were the lords of the king and the king was their servant. The king is administering, ruling the Hittite land for the gods as their steward, so to speak. Okay, so he says, this is how an ideal Lord deals with his servant. And so now I am expecting the same of you. So he continues, now it is me confessing my father's sin. It is true, I did it. If there are amends to be made, the many things that earlier too, through that plague, Gatiland paid, that is, the deportees from Egypt, the prisoners of war they brought home, and the deportees, that which Hattusha, the Hittite capital, has paid through the plague, it is thus happening twentyfold already. And yet, the mind of the storm god of Hatti, my lord, and of the gods, my lords, is still not satisfied. That's the end of the quote. Um, so he expects from the gods leniency as any ideal lord or master would grant it to a servant who, out of his own free will, confesses a wrongdoing, a sin. It seems pretty natural and human that people don't accept the blame for their actions when there's somebody else that can perhaps be blamed for them. We see a lot of it today. Are there any more stories or rituals you can tell us about scapegoating or placing the blame? Scapegoating rituals in all kinds of shapes and forms were quite popular with the Hittites. And it is striking that uh, several of those scapegoating rituals actually had to do with plagues and epidemics. There is a quite literal scapegoat or scape sheep, if you will, ritual that was found in the Hittite capital among the Hittite texts as we have them. And the reason for performing the ritual is given as if in the land there is continual dying and if some god of the enemy has caused it. And this is the recipe they give. So they bring in one male castrated sheep and they combine blue wool, red wool, yellow green wool, black wool and white wool and they make it into a wreath and they wreath the one sheep and they drive the sheep out on the road to the enemy. So somehow in their thinking they are taking this illness, this curse that they feel is upon the country, they put it maybe in the form of all these colorful wooden strands, they put it on the sheep and then they chase it on the road to the enemy in the hope that um, the enemies will now get the illness. Mm -hmm. This is a modern a drawing, but I always mm -hmm. like these. So here you see a, a ram in this case, a male sheep with the yeah, on his head, almost like a hat, you see these woolen strands. It's black and white, but you have to imagine them as very colorful. And there are three Hittites here who with sticks chase the ram out of their country on the way to the enemy. That was a, yeah, an existing ritual that they used. We have another one, which is also actually mentions a plague specifically. And the reason given in the text is if some god or goddess of the enemy land is angry so that a plague arises among the population. This is what the text then prescribes. As the king is marching away from the border of the enemy land, they take one male prisoner and one woman prisoner of the enemy's land. And on whatever road the king came from the enemy land, on that road he travels and all his commanders travel with him. The one prisoner and the one woman they then bring before him. The king takes off everything that he is dressed in, his garments, off his body, and they put them on the prisoner. 
and on the woman they put the garments of a woman. And to the man, the king then says as follows, and now you get an interesting little parenthetical remark in the Hittite text. By the way, if it's not convenient to the king, he sends another person, and that one will take care of the ritual. It's one of those prosaic little jewels that you find often in Hittite texts. Okay, so what does the king then say to this uh, prisoner who is now dressed in royal garments? If some god of the enemy land has caused this plague, for him I have hereby given an adorned, a fully dressed man as a substitute. This one, this prisoner, is now great with respect to his head. This one is great with respect to his heart. And this one is great with respect to his penis. You, O oh God, be satisfied with this all dressed up man. Turn again, please, in friendship to the king, the commanders, the army, and to the entire land of Hatti, and let this prisoner bear the plague and carry it back into the land of the enemy. So it's the same principle as we just saw with the literal scapegoat or scape ram, uh, where they kind of put the curse that they formerly felt being on themselves, they put it here in the form of the king's garments on somebody of that country, and then they, again, they chase him back into enemy country and hope that he will bring back free them from the plague and bring the plague back to uh, the enemy. Which has got to be a great deal if you're that prisoner, unless you really start to see bad things happen to your country. What yeah. kind of guilt would you have to live with? Well, maybe he knew it was all a hoax. Imagining that these are really nice garments, you might be able to sell them off. You might be able to make a nice yeah. living for yourself. Nice. And yeah. meanwhile, you've got a naked king somewhere. Yeah, uh, standing there freezing in the middle of the road. Yeah. And did you say, did you say though, that the king didn't have to do it in parentheses? It, it could right. be somebody else that does it. It could be somebody else, maybe one of his close advisors or generals that he would order to, hey, take off your clothes. And uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, I, I find it fascinating how the ancient approach is in the end not fundamentally that different from our approach nowadays. So in the case of this plague coming from Egypt, the Hittites knew more or less exactly where it had originated, uh, where it came from, uh, the, uh, the China virus, um, where it came from, uh, how it came to them, and they took no doubt their precautions. Um, social distancing and quarantining are very natural, have always been very natural uh, reactions to this kind of invisible enemy. Um, and I'm sure the Hittites may also, when the epidemic was at the height of its force, may have to walk, walked through town with their faces covered and so forth. Uh, they may have separated, chased away uh, more likely, uh, people who were sick. Uh, think of leper colonies uh, all over history. Um, and they, and in terms of measures to uh, curb it, apart from the, um, from the social distancing and the quarantining, um, for them, um, it was all these rituals that they uh, could try out and oracle investigations to uh, find out uh, what God was angry and how they could appease that God. Uh, that was for their, their vaccine. Uh, so the, the only difference maybe with nowadays is that we rely hopefully very much on science to finally rid us of this pandemic. Uh, and for the Hittites, it, wore, it was these rituals, uh, but those were their kind of science. So I think in the end, fundamentally, uh, the reaction to this kind of uh, uh, situation um, is not that different. 
For over 100 years, the OI has been a leading research center for the study of ancient Middle Eastern civilizations. Join us in uncovering the past and learn about the beginnings of our lives as humans together. Become a member by visiting oi.uchicago.edu slash member.